things and online. Just bring them, bring them all in. All right, okay. Just go back and read that. Okay. Um, so, one advise members in those of public alley that they can use your mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and all devices are muted. And you can connect to the assembly Wi Fi details are on the seats in the public gallery. So, you're not permitted to take photographs um, or record any of the meeting. Um, do you have any apologies? Apologies. Okay. Um, I want to advise members that your electronic tablets will be ready for collection on Monday the 17th of February from half 11 to 1 o'clock from the mezzanine room 301. 401. Sorry, 401. And room four, from the mezzanine and room 401. Sorry. It'll take about 20 minutes to encrypt and set up the tablet. Uh, this means that members will be able to access electronic committee meeting pack from this device and therefore paper copies no longer be provided. Uh, I want to advise that Philip uh, will be meeting with Sean Hogan and other members of the TB Eradication Partner Group, Partnership Group um, uh, after today's meeting and we'll update the committee in due, for, uh, due course. Um, draft minutes. Uh, from the 28th, of, 28th, there are pages 6 to 17 and 30th, 30, 30, 30th, page 18, 35. Um, did I get agreement for the minutes? Read. Read. Okay. Um, first up, we have um, a departmental uh, oral briefing. Um, I want to refer from the Food and Farming Group. I want to refer members to the briefing at pages 37 to 59 uh, and the memo from the clerk at page 2 to 11 of the, ta uh, the table of papers. I'd like to welcome Norman, um, Deputy Secretary of Group Head Food and Farming, Rosemary, Grade 5 Director of Brexit, and Colette uh, McMaster, Grade 5 Director of Sustainable Agri-Food. And uh, they're going to give a, a briefing and follow the um, briefing. Members will, uh, will have the opportunity to seek uh, so, just <coughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for having us uh, here, here this morning. So, I'll just give a, just a few minutes. Uh, you have uh, a paper from uh, uh, the group setting out some of the main uh, issues and functions that we'll be dealing with over the next while. Uh, but just give a very brief uh, introduction uh, to the group. So, it's six divisions uh, across the group. Um, uh, covering uh, Brexit, uh, CAFRI, uh, EU area-based schemes, policy economics and statistics, uh, science, evidence, innovation and sustainable agri-food development. Um, so the overall group uh, has a, a budget uh, of just over 48 million this year in resource um, and 14.5 million of capital uh, and uh, staff of about 870. So in terms of main functions uh, to develop uh, policy uh, in relation to food and farming, uh, including the implementation of programmes to support sustainable development uh, across agri-food. Uh, so to do that, then we implement policy through our inspection, payments, enforcement, licensing, uh, certification, advice and guidance uh, across agriculture, food, horticulture, uh, countryside management. Um, our payments function, uh, of course, uh, is a significant part of that. Uh, we administer area-based support schemes, uh, particularly uh, Pillar 1 uh, CAP support um, and uh, delivery of environmental farm scheme. We also act as the managing authority for the Rural Development Programme, managing the relationship with the, the Commission, uh, oversee the overall uh, shape of the programme and the expenditure uh, under the programme. But we also deliver uh, some of the measures within the programme uh, aimed at supporting uh, development of, of agri-food sector, so uh, particularly the uh, Farm Business Investment uh, Capital Grant Scheme, uh, Business Discussion Groups, Farm Family Key Skills, uh, Cooperation Scheme, Technology Development, uh, uh, Demonstration Farms uh, and Farm Innovation Visits. Um, 
CAFRI uh, is, is one of the divisions, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, so there, the, the, it's, a, its function is to deliver uh, policy on skills uh, and competence development for those wishing to enter, enter the industry or who are already there. Uh, so that's done across the three campuses, uh, in Greenmount, Lochery uh, and Enniskillen, but also the Knowledge Advisory Service, which aims to integrate uh, environmental uh, advice uh, along with uh, business advice, really integrating that into a holistic approach to business development uh, across the, the farm, land-based uh, and food sectors. Uh, the group also then delivers the uh, Dara Science Transformation Programme, uh, manages the science agenda for uh, with AFB, uh, setting and commissioning uh, the department's uh, research programme, uh, and there's significant volume of work. Uh, we'll be up to the committee a number of times over the coming uh, weeks and months around our new science uh, agenda, uh, our new uh, strategic framework and the, uh, the various uh, elements that are being developed underneath that around innovation, R&D, uh, monitoring and surveillance, uh, emergency response. Uh, so there's a, a lot of work will be happening on all of those elements over, over the coming year um, and will be up uh, to the committee uh, on the first of those uh, uh, relatively soon. Uh, and finally then, uh, and certainly not least, uh, to uh, lead and coordinate the, the department's input to the Brexit uh, transition programme. So that gives you a, a sort of a, a quick run over the, uh, the, the range of functions across the group. Say so you have a, uh, a document which sets out some of the main issues um, and uh, some of the issues that will be coming to the committee uh, on in the not too distant future. Uh, mentioned science uh, agenda, uh, but also issues such as uh, Tuition fee, fees for HE, uh, further education support. These are all things that are in train and we'll be engaging with the committee uh, over the coming uh, weeks and months uh, on all of those issues. So uh, that's just a very quick introduction. We're well, happy to take questions from the committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Norman, for that. Um, oops. Norman, one of the questions uh, I want to ask you was um, I think in a, in a previous briefing that you give us, made reference to uh, primary legislation, but I heard no reference to primary legislation today. Um, <coughs> is there any primary, legislation that, any primary legislation that the Department will be bringing forward? Yes, yeah, certainly my area will be coming forward uh, with uh, the um, legislative consent for the Agriculture Bill, uh, which was laid in Westminster uh, or introduced on the uh, 16th of uh, January. Um, so uh, we would like to have that uh, in place, the consent, uh, before Easter recess, um, and so therefore uh, I want to work with the committee just in terms of when best uh, to, to program that into your uh, agenda. Um, and uh, I think we possibly have a, a provisional date possibly uh, agreed, uh, but you know we, we can be a bit flexible around that. Um, so um, as early as next. Friday, I think, uh, subject to Minister's agreement, we'd uh, be able to lay the, uh, the memorandum in the business office uh, here in, in, in the Assembly uh, and then programme it into your, your work schedule then uh, thereafter. So that will cover, cover the, uh, the Ag Bill. Um, and that's all that would be, um, that would be bringing forward um, for summer recess. Uh, there may be other ones then uh, later on. Obviously, from a committee point of view, you not feel that it'll be a very challenging thing <coughs> for us to properly scrutinise and take evidence. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's uh, I suppose it's a uh, it's a reflection of where we are uh, and just uh, and the recent restoration uh, of the assembly. Um, the importance of the bill uh, is that it's it's essentially about status quo. Uh, it's about giving us the the powers uh, to continue uh, cap support. Uh, which obviously now becomes a domestic agenda uh, after this year, uh, both Pillar 1 Pillar 2, uh, to look at issues such as simplification uh, as well as just uh, running forward uh, what we have until such times as we set our own agenda, our own framework, uh, which I would imagine then would require uh, primary legislation here uh, to actually take that forward. So really, it's about enabling us to maintain uh, the, the ongoing uh, support regime, simplify it, uh, certainly, uh, until such times as we're ready to strike on, out on our own pathway. 
Okay. I'll, I'll bring in our members here. Rosemary, you have any case? Yeah. Um, I just want to look at you know the future agriculture policy framework. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the regime, the 2020 regime, is going to mirror what we've already got now in 2019. Yeah. Um, that's okay, but when does the department hope to have a draft future agricultural policy? When do you hope to have that and um, the policy framework in place? And when, for example, are you going to have negotiations with the UK Treasury regarding funding? Yeah, so uh, we've already already engaged uh, with uh, stakeholders on the sort of preliminary work uh, setting, looking at the overall framework. We um, had that launched uh, August 2018, um, and that actually was off the back of effectively a bit of co-design uh, that we worked with our our farming, food, uh, and environmental stakeholders uh, to set a, a sort of high level. Uh, agenda uh, and the themes within that were around environmental sustainability, uh, productivity, resilience, uh, supply chain functionality. And we've been doing a bit of policy work then uh, around uh, the, the tools that we might use to actually take forward uh, that agenda. Now that we have a uh, minister in place, now we can start to try and uh, accelerate that process. Um, obviously, we'll be taking the results from that engagement uh, to the minister um, and then we'll, we'll effectively chart. <coughs> Uh, an agenda then for the remainder of this year into next year, uh, where we start then to try and firm up uh, on the components of what uh, the overall support regime uh, would look like uh, going forward. Uh, in terms of the budget uh, process, we have the budget for this year. Uh, thereafter, it, it will be part of, we're, we're assuming, the, the spending review process. Uh, that won't conclude, we think, until probably the autumn. Uh, but it would be within that uh, that the agriculture budget uh, would be set going forward. And you're aware of the uh, Conservative Party manifesto <coughs> commitment to maintain uh, the cash uh, expenditure out to the end of the Parliament. Yeah. Uh, so we'd certainly hope to see that reflected in the uh, in the spending review settlement. Okay. Yeah. And may I ask one, one other? Um, how real is the risk that perhaps future funding payments for farmers will be allocated through the Barnard Consequentials? Uh, we will certainly be arguing that it shouldn't be. Um, and I think there's an acceptance uh, that this is not something uh, that should be uh, barnetized. Certainly this year, it's, it's not barnetized. And uh, we'd like to, and we'll certainly be arguing, uh, as will all of the DAs, uh, be arguing that it should not be barnetized. Um, so this is an issue where you know, we take about nine and a half percent of the overall uh, budget for the UK. It reflects the nature and the scale of our agricultural industry uh, and therefore that should continue and we'll certainly argue that that should continue. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just, just seeing the back of, of what Rosemary just said there, Norman, um, the legislative, the, the continuity um, LCM we passed there recently yeah. had a mechanism in terms of continuing the movement towards flat rate. That's correct. You know, have you any indication of what the Minister's intention is as regards, like we're five-seventh along the way, yeah. five-seventh along that progress towards the, the flat or the equal rate by 2021? Yeah. Is there any indication of the Minister's intention? Well, the Minister has, has announced and uh, confirmed this week uh, that there will be no change for this year. Uh, so uh, there will be no further progression uh, this year, uh, but it is an issue then that uh, can be considered again uh, for 2021 uh, and beyond. Um, John. Chairperson, um, if, if I'm out of order, you'll keep me right. <laughs> <laughs> My question is to Rosemary, who's obviously in charge of Brexit. Rosemary, does the discussion of uh, the future of the export of bulk milk to the Republic come up in your remit? It does, yes, and certainly it was something that we were very focused on whenever we had the um, expectation that we could have a no deal. But with the current withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol, the export of bulk milk can continue across the border. But the issue that needs to be resolved is whether or not that Northern Ireland product can be mixed with Southern Irish product um, and then exported to a third country because we're still requiring clarification and it's really up to the importing country whether or not they will accept product of mixed origin. 
I think so, so that okay. issue is still ongoing and is an important discussion and it's something that we require clarification very urgently for both our milk processors and our dairy farmers. Chairperson, I think it's very useful to be aware of that and certainly uh, having lots of relatives near the border have seen the cows moving over to each other and they don't seem to have a problem mm -hmm. so I hope the politicians don't have a problem either. Chairperson, the only other, it's more of a comment, Caffrey is, uh, because I'm a former teacher, um, intensely interested in the education of our young farmers yeah. Yeah. and perhaps Chairman it's for you to decide sometime in the future we might have a committee meeting at Caffrey to see, you know, fully understand what exactly is going on there because I do hear good news about it but I do also believe it needs support. Absolutely. I mean, more than welcome to, to host. Uh, I'm very happy to host the committee uh, at, at any of the campuses uh, and, and have a, uh, a look at what we do. Uh, and uh, I think, yeah, uh, we're certainly very keen to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John. And Harry. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. Good to see you again, Norman. Thank you. Just two short questions, Chair. Um, the environmental farming scheme. Mm -hmm. Having read the aims of the scheme and the money available. What monitoring has been done and what has been achieved to date? Yeah, uh, the whole issue of uh, monitoring evaluation uh, of EFS is very important. Uh, it's something uh, that we're very keen to ensure that once we come to the end uh, of the programme, we have um, uh, a robust mechanism uh, in place uh, to actually, you know, from a, a starting point, the baseline to actually measure what have, what have we actually achieved? What benefits have accrued uh, to the environment? You know, what's the significance of those uh, changes? Uh, but how has that compared then with the counterfactual? Uh, what's what's happening anyway? Um, so it's important that we have that uh, framework in place, and there's a lot of work going on right now uh, to ensure that we have a, a robust uh, framework to do that. And I think it's important not only for the valuation of what we're doing in this programme, but it's also to inform you know, what we do for the next one. Uh, so it's, it's a very important piece. Of you would say that your money's been well spent then? Well, that's what we, yeah. uh, that's, that's part, of, part of that. So there's, there's two aspects. There's the value for money aspect for, uh, of it, uh, but then there's the, 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 the overall uh, eva that's evaluation, which feeds into that value for money assessment. Okay. And just one more short question, please. On the Rural Development Programme, mm -hmm. post-2020, what guarantees are there for Rural Development Programme funding after 2020? Okay, so uh, under the Rural Development Programme, we can continue to make commitments uh, up to the end of this year, uh, and then it's effectively it's a rollout uh, of those commitments uh, out to 2023. Um, uh, and that effectively concludes the program, um, and then uh, so that that is that is all protected as such under the, the withdrawal agreement. Uh, so it'll be continue effectively continuing as if we were still members of the EU, um, and really then beyond that, beyond 2020, we start then to look to uh, a domestic agenda. Um, so what do we do um, our, ourselves? So certainly in the short term, uh, the agriculture bill would give us the ability to um, continue existing schemes beyond uh, this year for intake, if that was the decision. Uh, but also we need to look to think, uh, you know, what do we want to do? What's the new framework and what are the measures within that? So we really need to start thinking in different terms. You know, it's no longer pillar one, pillar two. It's about an overall uh, all-encompassing and integrated programme. Uh, for support of agriculture, food, environment, and how can we bring all of those elements together and complement each other? Thank you, Norm. Thank you, Chair. Uh, John? Uh, Chair, Chair, thank you. A, cu a couple of questions which are developing a the theme, I think, raised by yourself and, and also there by, by Harry. But before I get to the questions, I, I will make my, my first pitch for the Caffrey visit, of course, to be to Antrim. Uh, where members will see um, the fantastic facilities and also, of course, the, the wonderful setting of that site. Um, and I'll make sure that I'm there, of course. Uh, Chair, uh, some of this has been covered to an extent, but I want to, to tease it out a bit on the environmental farming scheme. I've asked a question that members might know in, in the chamber already about there seemed to be some uncertainty coming from the farming sector that 
um, Pillar 2 funding for that uh, EFS scheme um, hadn't been solidly guaranteed going forward under the LCM that was passed here um, now just over a week ago. I'd like some more information on that if possible and um, to clarify if that funding has been identified. And secondly, um, just to clarify also, figures for the number of schemes that are detailed in our, in our briefing, uh, the target was to have 6,200 agreements in place by 2020. The figures there are explaining what's in place. I'm wondering if there's any overlap between the figures and where are we in delivery in comparison to the 6,200 target then? Okay. Uh, so first of all, on the uh, the LCM, the LCM was really about Pillar 1, uh, where uh, it was because of the architecture of the withdrawal agreement, uh, the, it, it had to be brought into a domestic uh, fr um, legislative framework to actually continue that. So it was, it was concerned solely with Pillar 1. Uh, Pillar 2 funding and Pillar 2 schemes uh, continue on uh, as is, uh, so they continue as planned under the Rural Development Programme. So there's no change there and there's no threat to the funding there, uh, so they, they continue uh, as originally planned. Uh, so there's, there's no issue uh, on that one. Um, area based uh, schemes then. Um, so, maybe just clarify the, the, yeah, exactly the, the, the briefing on the environmental farming scheme details that there was a target to have 6,200 EFS agreements in place mm -hmm. by 2020. Yeah. Now, the figures before us break down, um, some of the figures and the dates by, by which they were achieved. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeking the clarification. It would be easy to do some of the figures there, but I want to make sure that there's no overlap within the figures there. And if we have achieved that target of 6,200. Right, well, the 6,200 will reflect uh, intake for the remaining part of this year as well. Also, uh, so uh, I suppose we'll have to sort of wait and see, uh, but we're certainly well uh, along our way uh, to, towards achieving uh, that. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a number of targets within the EFS. Um, it's not just the number uh, of individuals uh, who are taking part. It's, you know, it's the area covered, all, all those yeah. sorts of things. Um, so I suppose it is a a demand-led uh, scheme as well, um, and, and therefore I suppose we really have to see how we, uh, how many we can take in for the remainder of this year. Yeah, okay. Uh, before we see where we, we finally end up. That's great, sure. Thank you. No, Bob. Uh, thanks, <coughs> Kehir. Look, my my question on the future food policy framework. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, it details towards the bottom just the uh, alignment and engagement that's going on with. England, Scotland and Wales, uh, but given the, that's, uh, the close alignment that's going to continue with the EU, uh, I mean, is there is there engagement or discussions going on with the South? That, that, that's my first point. And then secondly, just uh, with regard to going for growth, I mean, there, there's no kind of discussion or, or mention of going for the growing for growth strategy. I mean, can I ask just where where, where that fits in, seems that... Uh, you know, from the layout that we're going down a path of kind of separate strategy as opposed to an integrated strategy within the agri-food sector. Yeah. Okay. F the food uh, policy work is, is this something that's new for us? Uh, we've never really had a food policy as such, and this is something that I think is potentially really exciting uh, for us. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to actually brigade across government, uh, across the public sector, things that we can do around a food theme. So you can look into stretching into health, um, into education, uh, the whole issue around uh, obesity, uh, about reconnecting school children, for example, with, with uh, food, where it comes from, how it's produced, um, really embedding uh, good behaviours that they will carry with them for the rest of their lives. Uh, it's looking at uh, the tourism aspect of it. Uh, it's looking at the economic aspect of food. So there's a lot of bits that we're pulling together, and I think there's quite a bit of enthusiasm uh, around actually brigading a lot of what we, we do around a food theme across government, across the wider public sector. Uh, and we're certainly looking out into what other parts have been doing. Um, to, to, so we're, we're not looking just at uh, what's happening in, in GB. Uh, we're, we're doing our own thing here, okay. but it's about learning from others uh, in terms of what they're doing. They're, they're actually coming over and having a look at what we're doing. Uh, so, um, and we're, we're certainly not 
um, worried about plagiarising from each other. Uh, good idea is a good idea. Um, so it's, it's at the very early stages, uh, but uh, and we're sort of exploring it, uh, easing our way forward. Um, but we think there's a lot to be had here. Okay. There's a really exciting opportunities to be had here. Um, and we'll see where it goes. Uh, but certainly, you know, uh, if there are lessons to be learned from down south as well, we will, we will take uh, those lessons. But I, I think it is, it is something worth exploring. Going for growth, um, it was uh, 2013, I think, was the original report. So we're effectively, we're, you know, at the, at the end of that. Uh, we're really now, and that was constructed in a different time, a different context. Um, Brexit wasn't even a word. Uh, back then. Uh, Simpler days. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, so, effectively, we're now looking to the future um, and going for growth. Uh, effectively, uh, you know, it's, it's the, we're in the run-out phase of that, effectively, um, and it's now looking to the future and where, where we go from here. Um, and, and it's a different agenda. In terms of its overall uh, approach of integration, I mean, is, I mean, I know you're talking about looking forward, but, I mean, are we still a lot having an integrated approach as opposed to... Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, certainly uh, what you have, particularly with the creation of DERA, uh, again, post-dates uh, going for growth, uh, is really bringing in the environmental agenda into uh, and integrating with uh, the agriculture agenda and the food agenda as well. And it's reflected as well, in, for example, in the creation of the Knowledge Advisory Service, where we've actually restructured to actually bring environmental advisors into... Uh, the, the the business areas, uh, so that we don't just talk about business performance. It's about integrating the environmental performance into the business and make it part of the business, um, and really driving that agenda forward. And we'd like to see that reflected also in in, the, in terms of the future uh, framework, agriculture framework, where we do talk about environmental sustainability. Uh, so it is very much about pulling all those strands together. Thank you. Um, Morris. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thanks very much for coming in front of us, to the front of the committee today. Um, it's in Food and Farming Group, you have 870 full-time staff, uh, you have a resource budget of £48.4 million. How much uh, of that resource is staff costs? And outside of staff costs, what would be the main resource expenditure costs? And what capital projects uh, can you identify? And uh, what's your main spending pressure? Okay. Uh, in any order. <laughs> <laughs> so, quite a bit in there. So, uh, most of that uh, resource budget would be on staff salaries. Uh, mm -hmm. So, sitting outside of that uh, is, for example, uh, the 290 odd million uh, CAP monies uh, or agricultural support monies that we administer. Uh, so, it's not part of our resource budget as such, but it flows through mm -hmm. uh, uh, the accounts, uh, uh, as it were. So. You know, the majority of that 48 million would be on uh, staffing costs. Um, uh, would be biggest, but we can get you a further breakdown of that. On the capital side, uh, obviously the capital grants uh, would be a significant uh, element of that uh, within our, our budget. Um, and um, also, well, um, there's been a little bit of a switch uh, this year, uh, but. Uh, the research agenda uh, used, used to be a part of our budget. It's now been switched over to another part of the department, but that all research is, is scored as capital. Um, and just trying to think, um, yes, there would be a certain amount of capital development, uh, for example, at, at CAFRI. Uh, so there would be capital there as well. But we, we can get you a breakdown of that. Uh, oh, appreciate if that would be helpful. Yeah. Can I, can I squeeze another one in, or you? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And it's about the environmental farming scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, how much of the projected 96 million spend has been taken up to date? And what achievements have been evidenced to date on water management, water quality, and the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, uh, I would need to come back to you on the, uh, the spend to date. Um, it's, well, it's, it's, it's more commitment uh, because we make a commitment, but the spend happens over uh, the ensuing five years. Uh, so, um, so we just need to sort of set that out uh, for you, so that you can see what's mm -hmm. committed out of the 96 million. Um, and it comes back to the point then around the uh, the monitoring and evaluation framework. Uh, that's where then we will seek to actually be able to define uh, what what the, the scheme is is delivering. Uh, and because you're you're dealing with environmental systems, uh, it takes a little while before the intervention to actually start to see the benefits of the intervention coming through. 
and that's what the monitoring evaluation framework uh, will seek to do. Could you maybe give me an idea, maybe at a different time, or send it to me, what, what the evidence you have to date would suggest, yes. especially yeah. in the water quality yeah. and uh, we, we can, we can greenhouse gas reduction? Yeah, yeah we can follow up with that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Claire? Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for that. I think I share your excitement in terms of the, the possibilities and potential about um, what can come with the environmental and food aspects and, and developing that policy as well. And I'm looking at the environmental farming scheme uh, and the numbers that have signed up for the, the amount of applicants um, that have been taken on successfully, but you don't give us any number. I'm just curious to see how many would have applied. I know you're giving us a number for how many were placed, and I'm just trying to see if there was a higher demand, maybe, than we were expecting or you were expecting. Yeah, on the wider scheme, uh, it's largely been a case of taking uh, you know, in uh, the numbers that have applied. Uh, okay. On the higher scheme, there has been a, a, um, uh, a prioritisation uh, within all of that. Uh, like on the higher scheme, what we want to ensure is that we want to capture the most valuable uh, habitat uh, within that. Uh, so therefore, there has been uh, a degree of prioritisation within the higher scheme. Um, and I think the numbers actually do uh, set out some of the, uh, um, the differences uh, there. So, for example, in paragraph 6 on the higher, uh, there was 932 applications. Um, uh, there was 305 letters of offer issued. Uh, and uh, 228 that plans actually come back in against those offers. Um, so you can see there's, uh, there's significant interest. Uh. But then maybe just so the agriculture bill is coming. Did you say it's going to be laid in the library on Friday? Did I yeah, pick yeah, that up wrong? The, me the memorandum. The yes, memorandum. that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So, seeing this um, is being put together. Oh, sorry, Friday, Friday next week. Yep. Sorry. Friday next sorry. Week. Yeah. When this was being devised, what, what type of measures um, were, were used in there? Are we using, so the UK government uh, has signed up to um, move to net zero by 2050. Mm -hmm. So are we using those types of projections in terms of the environmental impacts and future planning within that legislation? Yeah, uh, the Ag Bill, uh, as far as it relates to us, yeah. uh, is, is really just uh, about uh, maintaining uh, our ability to continue with what we have. It doesn't actually strike us out in a new direction, uh, and striking out a new direction will really be for subsequent primary legislation that we will mm -hmm. come here with, uh, but that will be part of uh, the overall future agricultural framework. But also, um, there will be uh, that broader uh, agenda around uh, climate change, climate change act, uh, and how those all fit together as well, which obviously goes much wider than simply agriculture. Yeah. Uh, so that sort of yeah. brings me in. Then Northern Ireland doesn't have it, a climate change act. Not yet. No. No. And when you look at the the, the work going on through the other UK regions, obviously Scotland, um, in particular, <coughs> is an outlier in terms of being ahead in a lot of other places or a lot of other issues, particularly around food. Um, do we have different legislation currently in Northern Ireland than other parts of the UK? So if this agriculture bill, I know this is basically a transposition of mm. the existing EU just to get us through the transition period, mm -hmm. um, but given that all the different regions are in different places mm -hmm. um, and different legislation maybe exists in different places. I'm thinking particularly for the eggs sector here as well. So Northern Ireland has strong uh, legislation around that. Am I right? But other UK regions wouldn't? Uh, no. no. Um, in terms of eggs, what are you thinking here? Uh, I mean, in terms of marketing standards, things like that, I mean, we'd all, yeah. op we'd all operate to a common uh, framework. It's all the same? Yeah, it's all the same. Okay, um, so there's n there should be no concerns about different sort of devolved powers having different levels of legislation on food quality and food standards? So go going forward, uh, obviously, to date, we've all operated within a, new, a European framework. Yeah. Going forward, um, environment, uh, agriculture, fisheries, these are all fully devolved matters. So the powers come back, shift from Brussels back to the Baltic administration, yeah. and uh, we can all then step to step our own uh, policy agenda moving forward. Now, in so doing, uh, I mean, we have to obviously um, implement the protocol, uh, and that, uh, and so in certain areas like standards, uh, we'll be operating to a European uh, agenda. Um, but in other regions of the UK, obviously, they won't have that. But at the same time, there's a single UK internal market, 
Um, and what we need to prevent is distortions of that by uh, the adoption of different standards or approaches that actually could create internal trading difficulties within the UK. So all of that uh, will be dealt with partly through common frameworks, where we'll look to see how we actually collectively operate uh, as administrations across the UK uh, to make sure that uh, you know, we don't create those uh, difficulties. Um, so it's, it's going to be a, a challenging agenda. Um, obviously, devolution was created uh, in an era when we all operated to European agenda. Now uh, we're coming out from that. Uh, so we have to basically devise new ways of working uh, together across the administrations. And of course, the fact that we also have to uh, we will be operating within the environment, the competitive environment of the island of Ireland. We also have to take that into account as well. Uh, so it adds to the challenge. Thank you. Roman, just can I ask a question? What, could you just outline to me our capacity to ship and amend the, uh, the UK Agriculture Bill when it is laid here? Yeah, so there is a, a specific... Uh, schedule uh, that covers Northern Ireland, uh, so that would be uh, the, the focus. The Agriculture Bill itself uh, is primarily um, uh, an English bill, but with some UK-wide elements uh, where we're talking about, for example, reserve matters. Um, so the bit that is of most interest uh, to the committee will be the specific Northern Ireland schedule, and that's where we take uh, the powers effectively, um, which would have to be uh, enacted through uh, affirmative resolution uh, to actually roll forward um, uh, measures that we have at this point in time. Um, so some of the, some of the issues uh, that we have around uh, modification of schemes, uh, modification of retained law around financing and management, uh, support for rural developments, data uh, collection and sharing, Intervention in agricultural markets, uh, marketing standards, data protection. So those are all elements that are, you know, within the schedule, and you'll you will see that. Um, and uh, so, absolutely, you know, the committee has the opportunity uh, to scrutinise that, uh, offer views on that, uh, and remember, I suppose ultimately, uh, do you provide consent or not provide consent, uh, is effectively the issue that will be placed on the floor of the house. Uh, around this issue, should we take those powers or not? Norman, is it an all or nothing scenario? Um, I don't imagine it needs to be an all or nothing scenario. Uh, I mean, effectively, if there are changes to be made, then we need to be making them before the bill is finalised. Therefore, it's, you know, uh, it will have to. This is why we need to have uh, this considered before uh, the bill uh, completes it, its uh, passage, passage through Parliament. Uh, and if there are changes to be made, uh, then we need to ensure we have a uh, sufficient time to do that. I want to bring William in here. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of issues uh, in relation to the environmental reforming scheme. I'm aware there's been, I'm am I right in saying there's been out two tranches of that? Two tranches, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The third was due to open, I think, some time ago. Is there a hold up of that? What's the current situation? When is it going to be opened again? Yep. Uh, so two tranches have uh, are in in operation. Letters offer um, uh, out there, and farmers working away against that. So the third tranche uh, was last year, for both higher and wider. Um, and so yes, we, we've 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 effectively taken an opportunity. Uh, well, we, we really needed to to actually step back and look at the shape of the overall programme that has been coming in. How does that actually compare with what was projected within the business case? Uh, and there has been uh, obviously a, a, different between, a difference between what was um, envisaged within the approved business case and the shape that is now emerging as, as farmers respond uh, to the uh, actual scheme. So therefore it was appropriate for us to actually step back and, and pause and say, OK, uh, we now need to uh, recast. Uh, the business case, uh, but also to uh, to make sure that for the emerging shape of the scheme, uh, is this still uh, delivering value for money? Is this still uh, going to deliver the environmental outcomes that we are uh, looking at, or has it been? Uh, is it skewing too much in one or in one direction or, or another to the disadvantage or uh, impact against other environmental? Uh, 
uh, issues that have to be addressed. So it's the overall shape uh, and, and cross-cutting nature of the scheme that we need to ensure that we're delivering across a broad front of environmental Thank issues. You. And this is what we're doing at the minute. And we would really be keen to have that completed as soon as possible. And um, David's team are, are, are working on that uh, at, uh, at this yeah, point. So I am aware of contractors and those that are expecting the scheme to be open. In the last scheme, there's big issues around being able to avail of posts and yep. things. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. So there was long tail max waiting on orders coming through. Now they're sitting and not knowing what to do. So has ordered posts and then had to cancel them again because they don't yeah. know what the scheme's open or not. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's probably unfair that to those people not knowing what's happening, I think it's important that yeah. decisions yeah. taken sooner and later. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, very acutely aware of that. Uh, and obviously this is something that the uh, Minister is uh, currently considering as well. Uh, so uh, we, we are very acutely aware of the need to get uh, decisions out there. Um, but also for for us from a delivery perspective, um, you know, uh, we have to have a uh, mindful of that and also for the remainder of this year, you know, a further crunch uh, is, is, is also something that we, we have in mind as well. So we need to get basically a, uh, a reset uh, in place as quickly as possible. Okay, that's my question. Oh, yeah. Okay. Re review of decisions and uh, there's a new process in from 2018. Yep. In that new process, still um, farmers can avail of an independent panel, is that right? Uh, That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, I would have to say that the new process uh, is working very well. Um, because the new process was about really trying to get it right first time. Uh, so uh, at the first stage, um, there is a case officer assigned uh, to the case. The case officer engages uh, with the farmer, collects all of the information uh, that the farmer wishes to, to put forward uh, in support of the, uh, the appeal. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, to and fro at that stage to make sure that everything that needs to be brought out is brought out at that first stage. Uh, so it's uh, so the old system. You were having new evidence starting to emerge at second stage, etc. And clearly, that that wasn't uh, an efficient use of anybody's time. Um, so it's about having everything on the table at that first stage um, and doing it quicker uh, than we did previously. Uh, which you know we're, we're getting we had a bit of a, uh, a hold up at the start because of the judicial review, but we're now getting back into towards uh, the, the timelines that we originally set for ourselves in this one. Um, and so it's to get it right at the first review stage. So there is an option to go to the panel stage as a second stage, but the number of farmers now going to that is much reduced uh, because they have a much greater understanding and much more feedback in terms of uh, A, the information they put into the process, but also the feedback in terms of explaining the decision that has been taken, uh, and therefore the numbers actually going forward to uh, panel stage uh, are much reduced. The panel stage itself, uh, because all of the evidence is now on the table, uh, the panel, its 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 process is different. It simply uh, looks at the paperwork and what has been presented, and considers it again, um, and. Uh, Again, uh, say a reduced number, and the number of um, cases where the panel is uh, recommending uh, a change in the original decision is now very, very low. It's single digits. Um, As you're aware, there was a th big sort of contention in the original panels, and I uh, attended some of those panels with constituents of mine. Mm -hmm. And I've had a couple of situations where the panel adjudicated in favour of the farmer and the department still wouldn't accept the farmer's decision. I thought that was absolutely ridiculous because the farmer had to pay £100 to avail of an independent panel. Independent panel, in my eyes, should be an independent panel. But uh, one in particular case of a young farmer, and uh, the family are just dismayed that the independent panel adjudicated in favour of them. And, uh, Department still wouldn't uh, agree to that, so I think uh, to me that seems a very unfair way to do business. There's no point in having an independent panel if their decision's not fine. 
Yep. Uh, well, again, uh, I suppose that's the, the previous system. I think the one thing I would say is the department is the paying agency, uh, and the department cannot delegate its de decision-making responsibility as paying agency, so it can't delegate that to anyone else. The final decision must always be the department's, and it must ensure that the decisions are in line with the legislation. But by having an independent panel, if they make a decision, that's that. That, that, that it the, doesn't the, mean any difference. Yeah, if, they, the if they make a decision that doesn't be adhered to by the department, you want to wonder why, why, why you have them then. You know? Yeah, and I, I don't want the, the committee to think that uh, we don't review our decisions. Um, and with the panel, uh, you know, the panel was effective in challenging the department, and the department did change decisions off the back of the panel. Uh, now, there are a few cases where the, the, the department ultimately had to take a decision that was not in line with the panel. Uh, in many cases, the panel agreed uh, with the department's uh, decisions, so it was operating uh, effectively. Um, and indeed, in the new process, um, I think of the 330 odd cases under the new process, uh, the first stage uh, has actually, I think it's about 80 odd cases where there has been a reversal of decision. But so you, it is effective. You can understand the dismay of a farm and family when, when they. Absolutely. The, well, the panel adjudicates yeah. in favour of them and, and yeah. still not yeah. upheld. Yeah. It's very demoralising you know, for that family. You know. Yeah, okay. Rosa wants to come, in, yeah, Rosa wants to come on that subject before that's there. Uh -huh. yeah. Just on, on the back of, back of what William has said. I also have had cases where exactly the same thing, the panel have ruled mm -hmm. and then the department have overruled their, yeah. their decision again. If you can't, I use the word trust, trust is not the, quite the word I want, but if you now, the panel have obviously made their recommendations for certain reasons, mm -hmm. and surely their recommendations should, we, should be equally considered in relation to the department's recommendations. This panel are chosen for their expertise. Yes, and I think that's... And uh, that I think it's, it's not quite right when they've made a decision for it to be overturned by someone that's... Someone else. Well, they've made a recommendation, and I think uh, I think I'll go back to the point that uh, it is only in a small number of cases, but those are the ones you hear about, where the the, the panel's recommendation is not accepted, um, and there are a significant number uh, where a the panel agrees uh, with the department's original decision, or where the panel actually ag recommends a change, then the the, the, the department accepts uh, the panel. So yes, there is a small proportion. Those are the ones you hear about, but it's certainly not reflective of the overall uh, regime that's in place. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Claire. I'm just wondering, um, Chair, looking. So under the new agriculture bill, we're going to be shifting away from the land-based payments into more productive-based payments. Uh, no, no, no. So we're copying and pasting for this calendar year, basically right. the, the cap system. But from there, the intention is to move to more product based, you no, know, and, and, that's, and that's measured on the public good. Or public the, yeah, public money for public good yeah. uh, is the the policy position of England. Right. Uh, and within the core of the la of the uh, agriculture bill, it's putting in place the the framework to enable it to do that. Uh, so, for example, there are provisions within that which, over a seven-year period, would, would see the current area-based schemes reduce uh, on a, sort of an escalator uh, down to zero, okay. uh, and really switching the funding across into environmental-type uh, public money, public goods. But that's the English component of the bill. Is it under Section 6, then, that for the Northern Ireland specific, that doesn't apply for us? That's correct. That's, right. that's England only. Okay. So we have within that the Northern Ireland schedule, that, yeah. that's the bit that applies to us. Uh, plus there's a number of elements within the, the, the main body of the bill which are UK-wide, uh, but they really are relating, relating to reserve matters, for example, WTO obligations. Okay, thank you. <coughs> John. Chairman, I really appreciate being allowed to come back in again. Uh, as someone previously involved in the Rural Development Programme, I hope I have an appreciation of just how valuable it was mm. and understand it's worth £228 million pounds from... European fund. But the last line of this report distresses me somewhat in that it says 
that it could continue for so long as ministers consider this appropriate. Now, given that we're now in a new assembly with openness and transparency, can we have an assurance that this committee will have every opportunity uh, to discuss whatever uh, happens in the future in relation to rural development? Because I think everybody around this table knows just how important it is, not just for agriculture, but for the whole uh, rural community and the uh, lifestyle that exists there and the incredible work through European funding that has taken place in the past. Yeah, no, absolutely, uh, and indeed, uh, and uh, I think the committee will hear from um, Fiona McCann, um, uh in a few weeks' time, and she's actually taken forward uh, a, a review of her old strategy, uh, and that uh, then sets sort of the framework going forward uh, from here. So, absolutely, there, I mean, there will be full consultation, there will be full engagement with the committee uh, on that. Absolutely, no uh, doubt about I think that. That's a very important point. The, I think we shouldn't underestimate the work of the LAGs and the, the yes. leader programme and what it's done for the social economic development of, of rural areas as a crucial element of this department, which we need to always keep up on the agenda. Philip? Can kind I of just follow on? Uh, John raised a very good point about the importance of, of the committee uh, having sight and con consultation in rural development, but even just following on from the discussion earlier about the agricultural bill, I mean, I would have a concern sitting here uh, about the, you know, the time frames and the ability of this committee to do its job properly with regard to all three bills that are going to be coming, you know, the agriculture, the fisheries and environment. Uh, I mean, we, we have an important role in ensuring that whatever is uh, comes out the other end of it uh, is, is a, a, appropriate. Uh, I mean, you didn't seem to have those concerns just when you were talking about the time frame. Uh, I mean, is there a concern within the department about the ability or of doing this work properly in the time frame that we're constrained to? I mean, this is far from ideal, um, and you know, in an ideal world, we would have been to the committee last year uh, on this uh, issue. Um, clearly, that was not uh, possible. Um, so we're in unusual circumstances, and uh, I suppose we're just doing the best that we can within the circumstances that, that we face. Um, so the, the Ag Bill uh, wasn't laid until 16th of January. Um, it actually was originally laid uh, in the last Parliament the last about a year ago, um, and so it, it fell uh, because of uh, the election uh, and has now been reintroduced, um, slight modifications. So, in uh, in normal circumstances, you know, we would have been talking about this um, a year ago, and indeed, we probably wouldn't even been talking about taking powers within a Westminster bill. We would have been talking about primary powers here. Um, so, it just reflects the circumstances we, that we face, uh, and so we're, we're all uh, you know, trying to, to make the, the the best of the situation that we do face, um, and it is a constrained timeline. Uh, absolutely agree, but I think there's. There's, there's not a lot we can do really about that timeline. But uh, the, the department, the minister, will in, will ensure even in the time constraints that the, the committee has its. Oh, absolutely. Has its yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We'll give, give the committee as, as much time as we possibly can. Are you looking in there? Yeah. <coughs> more, more general question. Sorry, now that we've broadened this out beyond the, the, the strict remits of some of the detail we have here, can I ask, and, and this is one that, that I might ask to, to, to those who present after this as well. Um, when, when we talk, and I've done it recently, about interdepartmental approaches, um, I'm wondering where we are with um, interdivisional uh, approaches within departments. For example, can we have an oversight, if not today, then sometime in the future, um, of where the environment will sit generally in relation to developing agricultural policy and how those concerns or interests or policy areas, call them what you will, will dovetail together within departments, so we know the Environment Division is working with the Agricultural Division um, to ensure that the environment is part of an overarching scheme, whatever policies are being yeah. developed. Yeah, yeah. Is that a, a reasonable question, and can we look to, to have some detail on how those are coming together, Chair? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, I can give you that assurance that uh, there, there is that uh, in intra, I suppose, uh, departmental working. Uh, so, um, for example, on ammonia, uh, on ammonia, good example, good example. Uh, where you do have uh, CAFRI, uh, 
uh, in the room uh, from policy side we're in the room uh, along with of course uh, our environmental colleagues uh, really looking at uh, this thorny issue uh, we'll certainly be uh, working collectively around uh, the climate change issue uh, absolutely um, in terms of uh, the future um, direction of agricultural uh, agri-environment schemes um, whilst I've said about within the, the, the agri agricultural framework uh, the actual policy work around that uh, has been led within within David's group. Uh, so we do very much work uh, together uh, across uh, you know, across lines of responsibility, and that's the way it absolutely has to be. Uh, we need to integrate, um, even in practical terms. Um, as I mentioned, the knowledge advisory service. We're actually looking at opportunities for people, staff who maybe uh, operate uh, on. Uh, and in David's group, uh, to actually come across uh, and, and spend a bit of time, um, and vice versa. Uh, but also in terms of the agenda that the Knowledge Advisory Service works works to, uh, it's there to deliver the policy agenda. That a policy agenda includes environmental issues, so it's actually about commissioning uh, effectively the direction of travel, the work from all parts of the department. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, even stretching beyond uh, environment, um, the whole AMR, antimicrobial resistance, big issue on animal health, uh, but it's CAFRI obviously involved in, in commissioning uh, through Farm Family Key Skills significant training around this issue. So it's different parts of the department all working uh, across boundaries to deliver uh, an integrated agenda. That's useful, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as there are no other questions, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, um, just for attending here this morning and taking a <coughs> broad range of questions. I think it was a very good discussion and thank you very much for that very informative feedback as well. And the rental will be seen you in the near future again. I suspect you will. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we're moving on to the next item on our agenda, departmental briefing from the Environment, Marine and Fisheries Group. And it's on page 61 to 89 on your packs. And there's a memo from the clerk on the table papers, page 18. And uh, I'd like to welcome uh, you here. Uh, we have David Small, the Under Secretary. Um, Group head EMF and CEO of NAA, John Mills, Grade 5 Director of Environmental Policy, Helen Anderson, Grade 5 Director of Environmental Environment, and Tracy Tay, Grade 5 Director of Resource Efficiency. And um, I'd like to just let's just Thanks. start the briefing and members will be able to uh, ask some questions whenever these are concluded. Okay, okay. look, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, thanks again for the opportunity to come along um, today to brief the committee on the work of my group, uh, the Environment, Marine and Fisheries Group, which is one of five groups um, within the department. You've just heard from Norman, who heads up the Food and Farming Group. Um, I know the committee has already received papers giving details about the structure of EMFG, um, the staffing numbers and the budget, so I don't intend to repeat all of that information. Uh, it's, it's in your packs. Um, I would say, though, that the group is one of the largest two groups within the department uh, with a very wide range of responsibilities, and those range from the regulatory activities within NIEA on issues like waste, water quality, pollution incidents, um, and agriculture across compliance, to issues relating to fisheries, both sea fisheries and inland fisheries, um, to marine issues, including things like marine licensing. Um, and to wider policy responsibilities for issues such as climate change, water quality, air quality, biodiversity, waste, recycling, plastics, nitrates, and various other issues. So it's a very wide brief. Um, for many years, the policy work and our regulatory and operational work um, have been dictated and framed, really, by EU directives. Um, and there are many of those, for example, the Water Framework Directive, the Nitrates Directive, Waste Framework Directive, and the committee will be familiar with, with all of those and, and many other directives. And those directives set out uh, the responsibilities uh, and how we took forward those responsibilities within the department for many years. As we leave the EU, um, we will assume new responsibilities for those areas of devolved responsibility, and that will raise new challenges and new responsibilities uh, for the department and, and, and for the Assembly. 
Um, over the course of the last 12 years, we have been addressing the challenges of Brexit, um, and key areas of work have been around the Environment Bill and the Fisheries Bill. And our objective on both of those bills has been to keep options open for a returning assembly. And like the Agriculture Bill, both both of those bills will require legislative consent motions, um, and we'll be engaging with with the committee on on those. Other new challenges that have emerged over the course of the last months, 12 months, um, have come from uh, things like an increased focus on climate change uh, and new UK government targets, increased awareness of single-use plastics, uh, which has become a much more significant issue, and again, to keep options open for a returning executive, we, we joined in UK-wide consultations on some of those issues. Uh, for example, an extended producer responsibility consultation and a deposit return scheme consultation. And the aim being to reduce the amount of packaging produced, um, improve recycling rates and reduce marine uh, and street litter. And we continue to work with DEFRA and the other devolved administrations to develop EPR and DRC schemes uh, and, and what those schemes would look like. And we'll be discussing those initiatives in due course with the Minister uh, and hopefully with the Committee. Um, we have also published a discussion paper on an environment strategy for Northern Ireland, seeking views from the public and from stakeholders on what a strategy should include um, and what the ambition of a strategy should be. Uh, and that would be a first environment strategy for Northern Ireland. That's not something we've had in the past. And we've had an absolutely fantastic response from the public and from stake stakeholders to that consultation. Um, we have separately been, been preparing an air quality strategy for Northern Ireland, which would uh, hopefully publish soon. And again, we'll be engaging with the committee on that. We are increasing our focus on climate change, both within the department, uh, but also through our engagement with other departments. Uh, and councils on issues like energy and transport. We have established a future generations group on climate change, which the Minister will lead, uh, and that will give greater momentum to our climate change work right across government. And finally, Chair, just a bit of reflection in terms of how we're doing, um, and it's mixed. So we've done really well on increasing household waste recycling. Um, we've, we've now achieved a, a recycling rate of 50%. That's a really good achievement, and it compares very favourably with other regions uh, across the UK. On water quality, we have 37% of our rivers and lakes at good status or better. Um, again, that compares favourably against England, but not so good against Scotland. Uh, and we have more to do. Recent data suggests that phosphorus levels in our rivers is increasing, and that's a concern. Similarly, dissolved nitrogen levels in our marine waters uh, is increasing, again a concern, and we need to think about what interventions are, are required to address that. On greenhouse gas emissions, we have reduced uh, Northern Ireland emissions by 18% against the 1990 baseline year. Not as good as England, Scotland or Wales, um, but better than Ireland, where emissions have been increasing. But nevertheless, more to do, uh, and that's uh, that will link directly to our wider climate change work. Um, our designated sites, uh, European designated sites, our ASSIs, are not in good condition. Um, and the requirement is that those sites should be in favourable condition. They're, they're not. Uh, many are suffering from uh, ammonia and nitrogen deposition and other pressures. And again, that's something that, that we, need, we need to address. So as I say, mixed performance. Um, and in many areas, we have challenges and, and more work to do. And that's just a flavour of, of what we do within the group. It's a very, very broad brief uh, in terms of the kind of issues that, that, that we're dealing with. Uh, and you talked to Norman about future agricultural policy uh, and where that will be going. And we will be working closely with Norman's team in terms of trying to shape future, future agricultural policy so that the environmental interests are, are, are captured uh, and addressed. Um, so look, that, that's just a brief run through some of the issues we deal with within the group. Um, happy that my colleagues and I um, take questions and, and deal with them as best we can. Thank you, um, David, for that briefing. Um, I understand that on like, the 30th of January there's an environmental bill was introduced at Westminster and there's uh, provisions for aspects that to be extended to here. Um, could you uh, tell me what is the, the, the timeline for that there? Okay, so we're, we're, we're very understanding of, of the pressures that, that the time frame is going to create um, for the committee. It's, it's certainly creating pressures for us. The timeline is really dictated by DEFRA and Westminster processes. Um, so the, bill, the Environment Bill was introduced on the 30th of January. My understanding is that 
they are hoping to bring it to the, the final stage, parliamentary stage in Westminster towards mid or late April. Would that be right, John? Um, the, um, that would be report stage um, early May and yeah. report stage that there's still for that's the House of Commons, it's been introduced in the House of Commons, it will go through the House of Commons and the, the penultimate stage is report stage and that's significant for us because that's really the time we have to get legislative consent um, and in theory if you don't, uh, if the Northern Ireland Assembly doesn't get legislative consent by, by then, then um, the, the, the UK government will take the provisions out of the bill anyway. So, the, and so that's the, the, the deadline for us. It's the last point at which um, these amendments could be made. And the, the danger for us is that the bill goes through rather more rapidly than that, and that that's brought forward. But at the moment, the time scale is um, something like early May is, is the absolute deadline. The stage before that is committee stage, and ideally we, we'd have, which is scheduled um, for sometime in March, mid-March, I believe, and uh, hopefully we'd have uh, legislative consent through by that if the Assembly was going to agree to it. And we recognise, Chair, that that's following a similar timetable to the Agriculture Bill, and you haven't mentioned it yet, but the Fisheries Bill. Uh, and it is unfortunate, but we've got three significant bills from the Department, you know, which, which are following a different timetable, Westminster timetable, and will be coming to the Committee, and I appreciate the, the pressure that that's going to create. Um, but as John says, the legislative con consent is required by report stage I th At the think, of, of, of those bills going through Westminster. Uh, and therefore, we have to try and work within the time that we have available now with the committee uh, and the assembly to try and uh, pr uh, progress the legis legislative consent motions. Uh, do you see then in, in progress, like it mentions that the departments here were consulted and they were broadly content? Uh, and that doesn't say unanimously mm -hmm. consent mm -hmm. or very content. Well, what, I take it there were some issues raised, was there? Or well, I think by and, large, by and large, most of the departments were, were absolutely content with, with the provisions in the bill. There were one or two departments who had raised one or two concerns, uh, and we've been discussing those issues with departments. John, do you want to elaborate? Uh, yes. So I'm uh, trying, trying to remember some of these. Uh, as David says, most... Um, most departments were, were content. Uh, Department of Economy naturally enough said, well, whatever you're doing, we're concerned about the, uh, any impacts on, on the single electricity market. So uh, and that was just a, a marker. Um, our colleagues in um, the Department for Communities had wanted to, um, had raised questions about whether the bill could be extended to cover the built environment as well as the natural environment. Um, in, uh, we'd also gone to the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman had uh, some issues around um, disclosure of information from, from uh, investigations and the Department for Infrastructure had raised issues, um, a number of issues, um, uh, one being about where the flooding was, um, was, was encompassed by uh, the, uh, would be caught by the Office of Environmental Protection or not. So th those were the sort of issues that came. So the, the, the issues were narrowed down eventually to those three or four particular areas, and we, we have been engaging with, with other departments on those issues. We're going to member say, uh, William, you're first on this. Thank you, Mr Chairman. In relation to ammonia, and we are aware that ammonia levels are high. There are a number of things that can be done to reduce ammonia levels. What steps will the department take to try and those in place. Yeah, so there, there, we, we have two, two work streams really, William, on ammonia at the moment. One relates to what we can do in terms of working with the industry and helping the industry to put in place measures and mitigations that will, will do just what you've described, reduce ammonia emissions over time. And I think we recognise it's not going to happen immediately. Um, reducing ammonia emissions will, will take, take a, a long time, but we need to find the right mitigations and the right measures that farms can take to do that. So that, that's one piece of work we're doing. We've, we've been working with various stakeholders and the industry in terms of what those measures would be. Things like low emission spreading, things like closing slurry stores, 
and um, extended grazing and, and a range of other measures that, that would move us in the right direction. So, th so that, that work is pretty well advanced. Um, and I expect that later this year we'll be putting out uh, a more formal consultation, setting out what those measures would be and seeking views from, from all stakeholders, but, but obviously from industry as well on that. The separate piece of work we're doing then is in terms of our role as a statutory consultee in the planning process. And when uh, an application for development, not just agriculture, but any development or road, in, road infrastructure development comes to, to us as a statutory consultee, we have to give a view on the environmental impact and whether we believe there could be adverse impacts from that development, and that would include impacts from ammonia. So we have a role in doing that, and we operate on the basis of a, what we call a, a, a protocol that sets out a, a set of thresholds that we will apply in terms of how we fulfil that role. Um, recent court rulings uh, and case law emerging uh, from, from various courts uh, has, has made us re-look re at, at, at that protocol to try and determine is, is, it, is it still valid, is it still compliant with, with our wider obligations, and we're in the middle of that piece of work at the minute. Pretty advanced on that, and we will be discussing that with the Minister uh, over the coming weeks. So that, that, will, that will determine where we need to go in terms of that protocol and how we then offer our advice back to councils, which could have an impact on, on all sorts of development, but including agricultural development. Um, and I expect, again, that we will be going to consultation on, on that piece of work, hopefully within the next um, weeks, if, you know, if not weeks, a couple of months. Um, and we're deciding at the minute whether we, we take those two bits of consultation out together or whether we go with one and then follow with the other. And we haven't quite, quite worked that out yet. Um, and we haven't had a full discussion yet with the Minister on, on the issues. But there are challenges around ammonia, which I think everyone now recognises, uh, and challenges that we need to try and address. And we'll, we'll, be, we'll be having those discussions with the Minister in the coming weeks uh, and hopefully then progressing to public consultation. And we are, we are told that some of these measures can reduce ammonia levels drastically, for instance, in relation to spread and slurry. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's important that, that measures are put in place to deal with the issue that doesn't end up curbing our industry but not doing it. You know, I think, I think it's important that... that yeah, so I, I agree. It's, it's important that, that we, we, begin, we begin to do that as soon as we can so that we begin to get the benefits of, of the reductions in ammonia emissions. But reducing ammonia emissions is, is going to take a long time. And the reason we want to reduce ammonia emissions is because they have an impact on our, our precious priority habitats, our designated sites. And there are public health links in terms of, of ammonia and, and the risks uh, associated there. So there are good reasons why we want to do it. There are obviously also um, ha habitat directive obligations uh, and other air quality obligations that, that, that we need to meet. Uh, so, so the need to do it is clear. Um, in, in reducing ammonia emissions, we, want, we also want to be sure that we're reducing them enough to see the benefits in terms of the, the current negative impacts they're having on designated sites, because we, we need, we need, we need to, to get the right outcome from this as well. So there's, yeah, when, it's a big issue and it's, it's a difficult one. And when one looks at designated sites with the, with the naked eyes, they look perfectly normal. But it's, uh, you know, yeah. when we look and, at them, they and, and, and I appreciate a lot of our designated sites look look great. Yeah. But if if you if you look closely, you'll see some of the damage that's uh, that's beginning to occur, where in parts of sites you'll have a a, a, a piece of habitat that's beautifully coloured. It's, it's bright green, vibrant yellow. <laughs> you'll have other identical plants that are just turning to slime and we have had international experts over who have confirmed the cause of the problem being ammonia and nitrogen deposition so i think we can't get away from the problem that it's causing harm and some damage and the sooner we can turn the curve in terms of ammonia which unfortunately has been increasing over the last five years quite significantly we want to stop that increase and begin to turn it into a decline i have to move on here now. Sorry. Um, Thank you, Chair. No problem. <laughs> Thanks to the department. The Fisheries Bill and the Joint Fisheries Statement. Mm. When will this statement be published and what plans are the department making in order to meet the policies? Does the department have plans to have public consultation on the bill? Um, it is good that DERA will be responsible for introducing new regulations for the MI zone and its vessels. 
So the NI fleet now benefit significantly higher shares of the RIC stock as they are at present disadvantaged. I know there are ambitions to expand instead of decline. Yeah, well, I, I, so I, I, can't, I can't give a guarantee today that, that the Northern Fleet will benefit from increased shares. In, ter in terms of what we're trying to achieve, that, that will certainly be our goal. Um, the Minister's already made it clear that he, he wants the, fish, the Northern Fishing Fleet to benefit from Brexit and benefit from the opportunities that Brexit brings. Um, so all of, all of that is going to be determined through wider UK-EU negotiations in terms of future fishing agreements. Uh, and you know that will determine how much of, of the, the stock from UK waters will be made available to EU uh, fishing boats and, and, and vice versa. Uh, so there, there, there will be a, a very high level fisheries negotiation taking place in the coming months that will, will determine at some point the, the quantity of fish stock that will be available for dis distribution within the UK. We will then be negotiating with other UK fisheries administrations, Scotland, Wales, Isle of Man, England, around how the UK quota is going to be shared out. So I, I suspect our minister will be negotiating very hard. We'll be advising the minister on that to try and ensure that, that we, we, we come out of that well. Um, the fisheries bill then is another key piece of work that will be going forward, and that, that's the bill that will provide the framework. So it, we, we will no longer be bound by the common fisheries um, framework. And the fisheries bill will will deal with with the UK becoming an independent coastal state and what that means. It will deal with things like the sustainability of fish stocks going forward as a, as a key principle. It will deal with things like how we um, set fishing opportunities and how we control access to UK waters. So the fisheries bill is a key piece of work going forward, and I appreciate that brings us back to the, the role of the committee in terms of the legislative consent. Uh, motion, um, and, and that, that that bill was introduced on the 29th of January. It will be working through a very tight um, parliamentary timetable as well. And I think on both the fisheries bill and the environment bill, our, our our requirement is to have legislative consent in place before the Easter recess. I think that needs to be our target. But I appreciate the pressure that creates um, for the committee. Um, I think if we miss that target, then, then we may we may miss the boat, excuse the pun, entirely. Um, so th there's there's a lot to play for on fisheries. Um, I think the minister is, is very aware of that, and has made it clear that you know this this is going to be one of his priorities. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. No, I'm Chairperson. I thank Mr. Small for his his presentation. I don't take any particular issue with it. But I do want to raise a couple of questions. It is absolutely shocking that 96 per cent of ammonia emissions in Northern Ireland produced by the agricultural industry. That worries me, certainly not to attack the agricultural industry, but the very opposite, to protect and defend it. Now, you have put forward nine bullet points here. I certainly would want to hear how you intend to resource this. But I'm particularly interested uh, in your role as a consultee with local uh, council planning committees, because you know, Mr Small, as I know, that your previous policies of promoting intensive factory farming has led to an avalanche of uh, planning applications for anaerobic digesters and other related uh, uh, developments. How do you reconcile your uh, promises to reduce ammonia while at the same time contributing to planning applications which may go through and actually do the very opposite of what you intend to do. Well, I think that brings me back to the very point I made about being at a stage now we are, where we are reviewing our current approach. Um, so we have been operating under an arrangement for a number of years, um, which, as you, as you say, have, have permitted some developments to, uh, and, and some intensive developments to take forward, and that, that was done on the basis of a policy that was in place at that time. Um, because of court rulings, because of the damage that we're, we're, we're seeing on some of our designated sites, and because of our wider obligations and the need to be compliant with, with all of those wider obligations, we are now reviewing our approach in terms of how we determine the impact of any kind of development on our designated sites. Uh, and in terms of ammonia, you're absolutely right. You know, 96% uh, 
often when you come from agriculture in Northern Ireland, that reflects the nature of agriculture in Northern Ireland, very, very much a livestock-based agriculture sector. Um, but it, it does reinforce the need, both in terms of reviewing our current policy approach, but also accelerating as quickly as we can the work we need to do with the industry to put in place the mitigating measures that will reduce ammonia from farms and move us in a better direction. Um, and that, that work is, as I say, is well advanced. You, you've listed, I think, nine, nine potential measures that could reduce ammonia emissions. Um, you know, any farm can do any of those any of those things. They, they don't need for the, de the department to produce a, an ammonia plan or a, an ammonia strategy. I mean, farmers can do that at any time. But you're right, there's a cost associated with some of those measures. Uh, and the department will, will be thinking about how we can support the industry in making that change. I, I, I view ammonia as probably one of the biggest challenges the industry's faced since the Nitrous Directive and the various obligations that came out of that around increased storage requirements, stocking limits, and you know a significant cost around storage. And I think in terms of dealing with the ammonia challenge, there will be a cost to industry in terms of moving in a, in a different direction. And the department needs to think about how it can support the industry through that. And that's, that will be part of the work we're doing as well. Chairperson, just very briefly, there is a cost and there is also a time scale. And certainly you did say that it would happen over time, it wouldn't happen immediately. I'm sure this committee will be glad to have regular updates on the progress of those nine points you've made there. Absolutely, yeah. I'll be there. give that commitment. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, it's good to hear that the environment strategy is moving on as well. I suppose maybe just a quick question on that one is to ask, can you see this being the framework for a potential climate act for Northern Ireland? Uh, it could be. It absolutely could be. Um, we, we, I suppose we're at a stage now where, in the absence of an assembly, we, we thought it was, was important given the pressures of climate change, given the fact that we were leaving the EU and all of the environmental governance that came with that, that we began to think about, you know, how do we how do we deal with the environment going forward? And the environment strategy was was an attempt just to put a set of proposals out, out to the public and to stakeholders to take views and get a better understanding of what, what, what the feelings were around the environment. Um, as I said, Northern Ireland hasn't had an environment strategy before, so this would be a first. Um, We've had a fantastic response from the public, from youth organisations, from young people, from stakeholders uh, to that, that discussion paper. Um, and I don't have an exact figure, but it's well over a thousand responses, so it's really, really That's positive. At all. <laughs> but we now, we now need to do the hard work in terms of analysing those responses, understanding what they're saying, and then begin to, to develop a set of proposals. But alongside that, we've, we've now got a, a really big challenge around climate change. Um, and it would be odd if we, we didn't consider one along with the other. So I, I'm saying it, it absolutely could be the vehicle and the framework for dealing with climate change. Um, we, we need to sit down with the Minister and discuss what, what we've heard from the consultation, discuss some of the issues around climate change you know, and the targets that we are now faced with, discuss the commitments within the new decade, new approach paper, uh, and work out you know, how are we going to take that forward and, and what is the framework for doing that. Great. And um, just... Another one then in terms of the recycling, and I know that our recycling rates are, are continuing to improve. I was wondering if you have any evidence. I mean, recycling on its own doesn't go to the radical change needed in terms of tackling the root cause. Mm -hmm. You know, the production of waste yeah. has to, to come, and it's good to see in the environment bill that we're starting to talk about reduction. Do we have any sort of sense of <coughs> that consumption level? Are, are we seeing a drop in? The amount of the percentages being recycled continued, but are, is the amount going to be recycled and go to the landfill yeah, and start so to reduce? Are, the, the, are those messages coming John, through? John, you, you can maybe keep me right on this or, or come in at, at the end, but so as you say, our recycling rates have been increasing. We, we've, we've done very, very well over the last 10 years in terms of the, the point we've now reached. Um, similarly, the amounts of waste going to landfill has been reducing significantly, and we've been making really good progress. Under the Circular Economy Directive, the, the targets increase and get more difficult. So if we were still part of the EU, we would be working to those more uh, challenging targets. Uh, as we leave the EU, we need to decide as a region, so we, where do we want to go in terms of recycling rates and land, landfill rates? Um, but I, th I think some of the recent, recent survey and research work we've been commissioning do suggest that... Um, that the, the the creation of waste, the production of waste, is not reducing. 
um, it's still increasing, although we're we're countering that by increasing recycling. But you're right, we'd like we'd like this to reduce the volume of waste that's actually produced to begin with. And I think the extended producer responsibility work that we 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 joined the UK in, in a public consultation on could potentially do that because that, that's part of making producers take more responsibility for their packaging, for the waste that they produce as part of that. Um, so we, we do need to focus as well on the production of waste at the start <coughs> of the process, as well as the other bits that we're doing in terms of reuse and recycling. And just maybe, if on, can I, if you, okay, go on. I'm looking at, in the Environment Bill again, the, <laughs> the Office of the Environmental Protection um, and, and allowing for the establishment of that. Now, I note that it, it specifically states that that office will have, um, they be able to take legal proceedings under judicial review. Now, we all know that judicial reviews are very, very costly, um, can be very, very lengthy. Um, I'm wondering, do you know, has any other potential um, considerations been given, for example, to an equal right to plan on appeals, perhaps, or any no. other? Are we just focusing on the legal directives under judicial review? So I don't, I don't think the right the third party right of appeal. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think that's been a part of the environment bill at all. No planning reforms happen in our considerations. Possibly in planning, but I'm not. I don't think it's part of the environment bill. Um, no, no. In, in terms of in terms of what the if the OE, the OEP has a, has a number of steps yeah. before it, it, it gets to judicial review. So in the legislation, it'll be able to. Um, only one of its functions is to, if you if you like, keep government. Uh, uh, to do or to, to punish government for misdemeanours, but it, it can issue an information notice um, uh, uh, highlighting problems. It can issue a decision notice after that, saying you better go away and fix problems. And then ultimately, um, you, you, it can issue a ju it could uh, engage in judicial review proceedings. You'd like to think that whatever public body was was under the cosh would have responded positively by then. But at, um, okay, so they're, they're likely to be fairly sizable cases. So. Yeah. So I want to come back just to use the ammonia, ammonia for an example again. So court cases have been taken. When were those court cases? Were they recent this they, year? They, well, they were within the last 12 months. Okay. Um, but we've been monitoring and reviewing yeah. a, a number of court rulings uh, in terms of their implications, and they're, they're very com they're not straightforward. They're very complex. We've mm -hmm. been engaging with our, le our own legal advisors. Yeah, um, and we have the evidence to know. We can see the spike. We can see the twenty two percent rise over a seven year period. Um, we know that it, it states here the elevated levels of particulate matter in the air have been shown to lead to increased evidence of childhood asthma, coronary heart disease, as well as increased mortality. So we know it's killing people. Yes. We, yeah. we yeah, know we, that there's evidence to show yeah. that. So that we know we're not, you know, th th what I'm trying to get, when we have such strong evidence, when we have such weak legal underpinnings, when we know that we're doing so much damage, and yet the department is still sitting at the, the potential actions, reviewing policy, and court yeah. cases have been taken. Yeah. So where do, where do you, do you look at the ammonia levels, for example? Does the department le use the legal framework to... Um, Proof its current policies. Um, yeah, well, well, we will take legal advice where we feel that is needed, um, and you know, it's, it's appropriate that the department ensures, as far as we can, that we are operating in a compliant way. And the reason we are reviewing uh, our current approach is because of the court rulings, which have have made other regions do exactly the same. And we're not the only region reviewing our appro current approach and handling of ammonia. Um, so the the, le the legal the legal advice is out there. You know, you may feel it's taking us longer than it should to, to reach a conclusion, but you know, equally, when when if we change our current approach, we we stand an equal risk of challenge from it, from the other side, from the developer who's been disadvantaged. And that so, would uh, so primarily be a financial make... cost more than anything. So, you know, are, are we measuring the impact on human health? To well, financial so, costs from so the other on, side of the sector? Yeah, so on, on the human health bit, we, we, we know, and we've engaged with the Public Health Agency on this, that there are links between ammonia and particulate matter, mm -hmm. and then the resulting um, impact on, on human health. It's very difficult to, to create the exact link between ammonia or ammonia levels to, to that, that health outcome, but we know there is some link, and I think for us that's, that's sufficient to, to make us look carefully at, at our approach. So we're 
we, we have been working on this for several months, so we're, we're not just starting this. Uh, we, we now need to sit down with the Minister and talk through the legal advice we have, our understanding of the legal advice, our understanding set against our legal obligations, um, and, as you say, the impact on the environment and the impact on human health, and, and reach, reach a position that will move, hopefully move us forward in, in, a, in a way that will allow ammonia reductions to reduce and allow you know, our input to the planning process to be as accurate as it, as it can be. Are there still planning applications for anaerobic digesters being submitted and approved? Yeah, yeah. It's the, <clears throat> obviously, as you know yourselves, uh, in that role, the department's the statutory advisor to the planning authority, and the planning authorities are in the council. Um, uh, so there are respective roles in respect of, uh, in regard to that. Um, also to indicate that the, the, in addition to that <clears throat> advisory role which the department has in relation to the planning, um, the department also has a decision-making role in relation to the granting of um, permits under um, PPC, planning, you know, PPC uh, Fish and Prevention Control Legislation or Waste Management Licences. And just as David has outlined, it's the same protocol, it's the same, sort, it's the same set of rules that are used by the department, you know, whether it's given that... Um, advice to the planning authority or whether it's making decisions itself around um, permissions that it's granting. Um, so it is very important to see if it says that the department um, takes full cognizance of all the best science and all, and all the best um, legal advice that there is. And it's, that legal advice is both um, from European courts and from national courts. Um, uh, so there, there's, a, there's a lot. It's a very complex area and there's a lot to actually look at in that context. We, we are working very hard on this, Claire, and, but, but we need to be satisfied that the, the approach we take can withstand challenge from, you know, from any kind of challenge, and that we're satisfied it's compliant and, and you know, doing the right we'll thing. We'll move on here. Philip? Thank you. A uh, lot of big issues in here. We could probably spend all day discussing them. Uh, I'm not surprised, as Claire said, that there was uh, a really good response to the environment bill. I mean, environment, climate change are, are probably the big issue of our, of our generation. Uh, just with regard, I mean, you talked about, following on from some of the questions Claire was asking about the extended producer responsibility and collect and return. Uh, I mean, there is going to be consultation here in the north as part of that. And there, there has been yeah, there was, um, it was UK-wide. Yes. Okay. There, there's been uh, one round of consultation um, really on three linked policies, the, um, the extended producer resp responsibility, the deposit and return scheme, and a plastics tax. The plastics tax is reserved or accepted, in fact. So uh, the other two areas are devolved. So we've had one round of consultation last year, and because there's a massive, massive amount of detail in it, um, there's another round of consultation probably around uh, May, June, something like that. On, on more of the detail on those issues. Some of, some of the powers that would, legal powers that would be needed to implement them are also in the environment bill. Okay. I mean, most, most of my questions and points have actually been brought up by, by other members, but just two wee things then. Is it clear that the funding from the EU in terms of fisheries is going to be replaced by Westminster? I mean, that's, that's, our, that's our, clear. Well, our, our plan is that the EMFF, which is the Euro, Euro, European Maritime. Yep. Fisheries fund uh, will will be replaced eventually by national monies. You know, but uh, co colleagues are behind me from from fisheries, so we, we can maybe pick that up when we go into the, the, the couple of fisheries issues. But my understanding is that we our, our aim is to put in place um, a, a similar type of funding, okay. so that there will be funding for the fishing industry going forward. I'm just I was looking through there. There's cost recovery powers described in the briefing somewhere, and I've lost the page uh, relating to fishing. Just uh, yeah. is there any detail on what exactly they are? I suspect that might be in relation to activities that the department needs to carry out, and we can where appropriate recover cost. But again, I, I can check that with colleagues when, when they come to the table. Okay, um, Morris. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, some of the points that I have here have already been uh, answered. But uh, following on from from Phillips' question there about the uh, cost recovery, just as, a, as an add-on. What are the services, and, and, and how do you manage? How you hope to manage to get the recovery back? And as an add-on to you, chair, could it be possible to have a breakdown of the current fish stocks in the UK and Irish waters? Mm -hmm. And uh, also, 
what plans are in place to monitor and conserve fish stocks going forward, uh, especially if we're going to have a, a, an agreement with the EU vessels, etc., etc. That's that's one question. The other one is on ammonia. Uh, and just a, a simple question, yes or no, have we reached saturation levels in ammonia in Northern Ireland yet, or are we about to? Um, I wish it was a simple question. Um, I, I mean, my own, my own feeling is that with, with the increase we've seen over the last five or more years where there has been you know, a pretty steep increase in terms of ammonia levels within Northern Ireland, that if we haven't reached it, you know, we're, we're, we're probably getting to a point where we need to seriously think uh, around the, the, the harm that it can potentially do and what we need to do to try to address it. So I, I couldn't say, yeah, we've reached a saturation level, but the levels are very high. Mm -hmm. And they've reached the point, I think, where the department is clear to the department now that we, we need to do something to turn the curve and, and begin to reduce ammonia emissions. Thank you. Can I and on question one, yeah. if, if Chair's happy, I prefer to write yeah. on, on that. There, there were a number of issues there, and some of them are quite, quite, uh, quite significant issues in terms of our uh, survey and monitoring approaches in terms of fish stocks, which I, I couldn't probably give justice to. In, in a verbal answers. If you're content, we'll, we'll write with, with happy. the detail on some of that. Can I ask a moment? Yeah. yeah. Can I ask Norman? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, plastics and plastic bottles is one of the main pollutants we have. Uh, we spend an awful lot of money segregating plastic. Where does it go once it's been segregated? Yeah. Do we recycle it or do we ship it out yeah, to okay. countries where it may lie beside a river and eventually find its way back into the ocean? Or, in the worst case, scenario directly back into the ocean. Yeah. So you, you raised, I think, this issue last I week. I did indeed. Yeah. Well, I and I wasn't able to answer the question. So, no, we, we have an arrangement in within Northern Ireland where recycled plastic goes to a recycling, a plastic recycling firm, and, mm -hmm. and they, uh, I think, I think they, they recycle it and turn it into plastic tubing. I can't remember the, the, the precise detail. But, so there, there are arrangements on plastics within Northern Ireland where a, a large volume of, of the plastics is recycled here within Northern Ireland. There may be some that would, would find its way out, out in terms of export, but certainly... Tracy has the figures. Yeah, yeah, Tracy's got six, the figures. Six percent, six percent of our overall uh, export is in plastics. Right, okay. So, the, you know, the large majority of it is, is recycled within Northern Ireland. One quick one. <laughs> I'm sorry, thanks for your patience. Uh, it's my boy dump. Uh, on a recent visit up there, uh, I noticed that the, the dump itself is higher than the valley that the river Falcon uh, flows through. It's a very important salmon river. Uh, is there any monitoring of the leachate from my boy? And has it reached the water levels? And can it then filter its way back into the river Falcon? Yeah, well, that, that, that would be one of the risks, but there is very intensive yeah. monitoring in place, both in terms of the leachate and, and what's happening to the leachate within the site, but also specific uh, monitoring by NI Water, which, which we help them with in terms of analysing the results in terms of the, the, the water going into the water treatment works and to ensure that there, there is nothing that looks dangerous or harmful going into the, 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 the drinking water. Um, and I water are absolutely satisfied at the moment that there's not. Uh, we're we're satisfied that the site is contained and but through the works that we've we've been putting in place, and that uh, the leachate, the metals within the site are contained. But that monitoring is very, very important and we will be continuing that monitoring as we begin to develop the the real remediation project. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience, Chair. Uh, uh, Chair, just a couple of things briefly to follow because I was going to raise my boy as well, but Morris has done that. But it would be useful if at any point um, if we got an, in, could get an interim update on the actions outlined in terms of uh, remedial action on site, uh, reassurance to local reps and um, individuals, and also um, forthcoming prosecutions or actions. If there was any interim written report that could be given, it might be useful, Chair, with yeah. the permission of you and the rest <laughs> we, of us. We can certainly provide some of this that. information. Um, we, we, we are constrained in terms of what we can see precisely because of the, the criminal prosecution, very yeah. constrained in terms of what, what we can talk about, um, but happy to provide information okay, that we, you know, uh, we feel we can. I'm also keen, Chair, to receive any uh, updates for, for all of us, mm -hmm. of course, on, on the actions and considerations around ammonia, and uh, I'm reassured to some extent to hear that there's some recognition um, at departmental level 
that one person's going for growth, for example, is another person's environmental concern. And I think we have to now have realistic concerns around that before future policies are, are shaped. And I wanted to flag up also, and I will come to my individual questions, Chair, uh, right now, um, for, for the information of those uh, joining us today. The uh, Assembly formed an all-party group in climate action on Friday the 24th of January. Some of us are serving on that, so there might be some uh, correspondence mm -hmm. and from an interaction with that group. Yeah. I have uh, two uh, separate questions. The first one's on the general area of waste management, recycling and all of those things. Has the department considered at any point that um, waste management strategies might need to be revisited also with a view to the future? For example, um, if we want to long-term minimise waste in general, and maximise recycling and recycling opportunities. Mm. Is incineration really a wise option for councils to pursue? Where a publicly funded commercial contract for decades would be assuring certain amounts of waste to be incinerated, whether, of course, the, that amount was incinerated or not. Um, I think there's a value for money argument for that, as well as an environmental <coughs> argument going forward, um, because it's not exactly an incentive to reduce waste or, or increase recycling, mm -hmm. some of us could argue. The second question is on this issue of um, an Office of Environmental Protection. Can I ask you if it's likely that the uh, department, or, or perhaps the minister, w is going to lift things directly from a UK environmental bill? Um, because the quoted Office of Environmental Protection could be perceived as something quite different to the um, independent environmental protection agency referenced in the New Decade New Approach Agreement, mm -hmm. which is something that some of us have campaigned for for a long time. Mm -hmm. So is there any departmental thinking about the difference in those two offices or organisations and yeah. where we will be if, if any of them are to be pursued? Yeah, so a um, couple of issues there. So we'll deal with the independent agency bit first. So that, that was, a, that was a, a clear reference within the New Decade and your approach document. Um, we, we are currently scoping what an independent environmental protection agency would look like. Uh, we're scoping what process would be required to create an independent environment agency in terms of legislation, what functions might go into an independent agency, uh, what the cost would be, you know, the whole range of issues that we would need to consider and the likely time frame involved in, in creating a, an agency. And that would be an agency that would replace what is currently Northern Ireland Environment Agency, but maybe not all of its functions, and that, that's some of the work that would need to be done. The Office of Environmental Protection, which is then referenced within one of the provisions of the Environment Bill, has a separate purpose. So the purpose of the OEP is much more aligned to what was the function of the European Commission and the European Courts in terms of holding member states to account uh, on failure to implement directives or failure to, to fulfil their duties. So that if, if both organisations were formed, they would be formed, but with different functions and, and for different reasons and with different purpose. Um, but we, we, we are at, at a point at the minute of doing some of the scoping work around all of that. We need to sit down with the Minister and discuss just, just where we go with, with, with those issues. Um, but yeah, there would be two two separate separate issues. I think on the issue of waste and recycling, um, we will be guided, and the advice we, we offer the minister will be guided by assessments of waste, volumes of waste, the capacity with an all iron to deal with the waste, um, but taking account of what we're trying to achieve in terms of greater reuse, greater recycling, and you know whether that concludes that we need some additional type of infrastructure, potentially energy from waste is something that we'd be a big part of that wider assessment. And then in terms of a waste strategy, John, we, we are committed to re renew and re update our, our current waste strategy, which will consider a whole range of issues around reuse, recycling, circular economy, uh, and where we go on all of those initiatives. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Chair. So, um, William? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just the point I was trying to make in one year, and uh, maybe just to make it clear, I, I, I think Many doesn't fully realise, but there are ways of reducing levels drastically mm -hmm. in relation to spreading of fluorine stuff. And I think it's important that help is given to industry and advice uh, on the way forward. I think that will make a big difference. Um, yeah. That is done, I think, something like 38% or something of them when you. Emissions come from spread, fluorine, spread, spread. Yeah. Of yeah. So that, that's a big, big 
issue. So there are things that can be done to to help the industry before we get into a situation where we curb growth in the future. I think it's important that we do what we can. So low, low emission spreading can deliver big reductions in, in ammonia emissions. Uh, and, and of course, and I'm a farmer myself, so sometimes the industry doesn't like change. Enough. And you know, we, I fully understand that. But whenever I think it, if they're made fully aware of the situation, I think many farmers do, doesn't fully understand or fully aware yeah. of the the issues that it could lead to. So I, th I think it's important that we work with the industry. I think, and I think we're trying to do that, William. So we, we have a, we have published a code of good agriculture practice on ammonia, you know, so that that's there and that will hopefully help. I think the recent um, publication from CAFRI, Ag Agriculture Notes, can't remember what it's called, had a, a particular feature on ammonia uh, and the work of the department and just simply offering general advice about it's the something, ammonia challenge. Something people can't see with the naked eyes, so they don't. Yeah. Yeah. Probably no, I appreciate it. Ammonia is an issue, a visible gas. Ah, you understand. And, and you need to be guided <laughs> by the experts. Hey, um, just before, can I just ask you? Just, I was picked up in the last round with Norman as well. It's the environmental farming scheme. Um, I just want to pick your brains on as well. I think uh, in your notices, we would be advised to be completed soon. Yeah. Do you have any indication of when that'd be finalised? Because, like William and other people, I've been. Lovely with this as well, where people are expect their contracts issues are yeah. what, what could you give us? Just be a, I think in terms of time frame, you know, we, we would be hoping within the next four, four to five weeks. And and, and there come there comes a point where it will it will be too late mm -hmm. for the industry and yes. for the department to actually process the That's whole the thing. So point. so we do we do have a point where you know if we if we let it run at beyond that and, and you're getting into March at that point. You know, the, there would be real challenges then for the industry and the department actually managing a, a scheme. So we we recognise that if you know if we're going to do anything, it needs to be within the next weeks. Um, but but I you know as I say, I'm talking about four four to five weeks. And I would have thought that was too long. I know, I know, and, and I think I appreciate the potential impact that delay has on the yeah. industry, William. So we we would be thinking about you know the associated commitments that farmers must meet. If, if they're having to, to start late uh, and thinking about how, you know, what, what alliances with the department could make around that. Thank you. Okay, folks, as I've no other members down here for um, questions, I would like to thank uh, the officials for attending here again. You. Open yourselves up to questioning and get a very comprehensive okay. brief as well. So I want to thank you very much for your attendance here. Um, members, the next two items on the agenda are SRs on the sea fishing licensing, uh, which have been deferred from the last two meetings. The department provided for the clarification um, on the issue, a number of issues. And I want to refer to you to the most recent paper from the department at pages 191 to 102 and 103 to 106, uh, which answers to some of the questions which we posed last week. Um, the apartment briefing, briefing paper from last week's meeting is at 107 to 110. These statutory rules, both of these statutory rules are linked, and there will be one briefing on, uh, on uh, cover both of them, which will then be followed by two separate questions. So I'd like to welcome David Small, um, um, Still here. <laughs> Still here. Uh, Paddy Campbell, Deputy President of Marine uh, and Fisheries Division, and Paddy Smith, Deputy Principal of Fisheries Policies, Policy and Grant. And I'd like to invite the officials to brief the committee. Okay. So, Patrick, are you happy to just give a brief account? So, this is on the two SRs that, that have been discussed already with the committee. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure what more to offer. I know we, we have provided written advice on some you know, specific queries from the committee. I think our view is, is, is that you know, the, these two SRs were put in place originally in anticipation of, of a potential no-deal situation, um, and they were, they were to uh, facilitate an arrangement which would allow access to UK waters to be controlled through some sort of licensing regime. Um, in the absence of a fisheries bill, which had originally been anticipated but fell. So the, the two SRs became necessary to try and plug that gap. We, we are now working on a new fisheries bill, which will, um, which will put in place the provisions that, that, that these two SRs are designed to cover. If the fisheries bill progresses as planned, um, our analysis is that the two SRs will no longer be required. And our intention would be to revoke the SRs in any case. Even if we don't revoke them, they they would no longer have any effect. But it, it's it's poor management of the statute book to just let them lie there. So we, we would rather revoke formally uh, both both of the SRs. Um, 
And I think, you know, my, my own feeling is that I'd like to see uh, some assurance that the fishery bill does progress, that the provisions are retained, and that that then makes the two SRs no, no longer necessary. Um, and at that point, we, we would then be proceeding to revoke both SRs. Um, so I think that's probably a bit of a rep repetition of what, what we were trying to present last week to the committee. Um, hopefully, the, the further information we provided um, in the intervening period gives a bit more information and clarity on the purpose and on the point I make about them becoming unnecessary if the first fisheries bill progresses. Um, but again, ha happy to take happy to take questions from the committee. Okay, I'll move. Uh, Philip, you, you're in a. I mean, first of all, thank you for your patience. I think it's the third time uh, in relation to this, and I appreciate all the information that you've given. Uh, Chair, I mean, through you, I mean, I have expressed concerns at the two previous encounters. I mean, I still share those concerns. I mean, obviously, for uh, uh, our opposition to Brexit is, is, is no secret, and this is. Uh, these are SRs that are flowing through uh, Brexit. I mean, I, I certainly am con concerned about uh, the language used and it about foreign vessels. And uh, and given the fact that the officials are saying that they're unnecessary and will be revoked, I mean, I, I still think that given that the case and my concerns, I mean, I would be proposing that, that the committee moves to annul the, the two SRs. Okay. William. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the technical, I don't think there's any major issue. I, I mean, I would have thought, I mean, I've been taking advice from the department on this, but it looks to me that they're fairly technical in my eyes and no major issue. Thank you, Chairperson, uh, just this issue as well. And, and really, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a choice of language and we do live in a society where the word foreign has all sorts of connotations and I think the sooner this one disappears and we get the new legislation or whatever replaces this, uh, the, the better. But uh, I am in a position where my mother came from the Republic, my wife came from the Republic, my son married somebody from the Republic, so how on earth could I ever describe those people as foreigners? I couldn't. Okay, so any other questions? Any other questions? Or? No. Do you want to I think just in, in terms of response, Chair, um, I, I, understand, I totally understand the point being made. In, in terms of, of practicalities, my preference would be that rather than a null, the SRs now, we, we follow the Fisheries Bill, secure the satisfaction that the Fisheries Bill is putting in place the necessary provisions that allow us to control waters um, in, in the future, and at that point then revoke. So the, the end result would be the same, but the timing would be different. Um, but that would just... I suppose my, my concern is that in, as, as the Fisheries Bill progresses through Westminster, for some reason some of those provisions are lost, and we, we then end up with another with no provision and no means of managing access to UK waters. Um, so it, it, I suppose it's a timing timing issue, really, um, but one where just having the assurance that the Fisheries Bill will give us the necessary provisions would, would, would give me the comfort that you know, when, when, we, when we enter that phase that we have the right powers in place. Um, and, and nulling the SRs at the moment just removes the safeguard. Um, so... That would be my view, just from within the department. Anything else? Okay. Um, right. One of four members that the, the business have recognised that the backlog of statutory rules across all the committees has been largely cleared. Um, they're considering moving to two plenary meetings per week. Uh, this means that today is probably the last day for the committee to consider and make a decision on the statutory rules. Um, so, uh, obviously, we. So, basically, 
we've, had a, we've listened to the, a number of briefings in this now. We've had some conversations on it and discussion around it. So really we should move on then. Yes. Stella. Um, so again, so I want to refer to you so 111 to 118 in your pack. Um, in terms of moving on, what did we, did we take a decision on... So we're going to put the question. Oh, no. right, sorry, the, no. sorry, I'm going to put the question. The, the, the procedure is that you, the, the, the question is put on, like in plenary, the question is put that you're content. Okay. You know, you've considered the rule and you're content. If you're not content, um, if the vote goes for content, that's it. Okay. So it's only if you're not content that the committee would consider, um, you know, and that the, the next step is to, to annul. Okay. To agree a motion to annul. Fair enough. Okay. Okay, so I put the question. Yes. If members are content to indicate, then that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, content to accept or content to annul? Just no, content to accept. The, the first question is: is there? It's not accepted. Then yeah. it's yeah. to, to okay. Sorry, yeah, yeah, the, basically, the, the question is that you have no objection to the rule. Okay. Is the Thank terminology you. used? So that the committee for agriculture, um, environment, rural affairs has considered SR two hundred one nine zero six one the sea fishing license order in Northern Ireland. 19 and subject to examiner's side of support has no objection to the rule. Great. Great. Not content. Okay, I just need to record this vote if you don't mind. Not content. Hang on, John. I'm going to just uh, record. John? Uh, not content. No. Agreed. Not content. Not content. Not currently content. Not content. I'm not content. Okay. Great. Morris? Great. Harvey. Great. And William. Great. So there are four who are content and one, two, three, four, five who are not content, which means then you'd be putting the question on annulment. Okay. okay. So this so the members are not content. So that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR two oh one nine zero six one the sea fishing license in order now in twenty nineteen recommends that it's annulled by the assembly. Um okay. Okay, and they, do you want to be, it'll be the same only the other way around? Are you just content with that the chairperson signs the motion? Okay. Yeah. Okay, Anything? as the committee has agreed to annul, I will now sign the motion to go to the business committee who will schedule it for debate. Okay. Um, Okay, number seven, uh, SR 2019 this the uh, sea fishing <coughs> license and noses and regulations order in 2019, page 119 to 127 in your pack. Um, I'm going to put the motion, and members can indicate where they are content, that the uh, Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Affairs, SR 2019065, sea fishing license and noses and regulations order in 2019, and subject to examiner's statutory report has no objection to rule. Great. Members, yeah, yeah. not content. Not con you're not content with that. Well, I mean, it's my understanding that this SR flows from the, the previous SR, which I'm not content. So therefore, yeah. I'm not content. Stay together. Okay. Okay. So can I just I'll, I'll take uh, the record the vote formally for you on that. Okay. So in terms of SR two hundred one nine stroke sixty five, um, John, your position. Not content. Not content. Okay. Was there? Great. Great. Claire. Not content. Not content. Philip. Not content. Great. Morris. Great. Great. Okay. So Not again, four, 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 four. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> four who have um, who have no objection, and five who object. So again, you know, the, the rule, the statutory rule will be annulled. Okay. okay. Um. Move on to item eight. Right. You need to sign them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so one of our members to report from the Family Society Rules Report, which has been tabled at the papers at, two, at 20, page 20 to 95, and the list of study rules that have been approved by the committee at pages 129 to 133 of the main pack. I want to advise members that the examiner has ex completed her tactical scrutiny of the study rules referred to the Euro Committee for consideration. No study rules are drawn to the attention of the committee on any of the technical grounds as per SO 436. 
with the exception of a number that um, have broken the 21-day rule. These have been highlighted in the memo from the clerk at pages 20 and 21 of the table of papers. The examiner advised the department has, prov has provided a satisfactory explanation for each of these breaches. There is therefore no need for the committee to reconsider any of the statutory rules. A member, uh, a member is committed to note the content to note the examiner's statutory rules report. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yep. Right. Okay. Um, now we'll have a, a briefing from the uh, Research and Information Service. I'd like to welcome Mark and Susie to uh, brief the committee. And following this, um, members can ask questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, myself and Mark, we're here from the Assembly's Research and Information Service. Um, I'll apologise in advance for those of you who know what we do already, um, but for those who, who maybe aren't quite <coughs> familiar, we'll just try and make this as brief uh, as we can. So, um, RAISE aims to meet the information needs of Assembly committees, uh, individual members and their staff, the Assembly Commission and the Secretariat. We provide non-partisan, objective and confidential research and inf information support across the broad um, range of assembly business. This may include constituency matters, preparation for plenary or media debates, scrutinising the work of ministers and departments, assisting with the scrutiny of legislation as it passes through the assembly. This may include assisting with the development and scrutiny of private member bills. Now, the service is made up of a number of researchers, and these are spread across a number of different teams. So I'll just give you a quick run through of those and what they include. Um, health and social care, statistics and mapping. Political institutions, equality, justice, families and education. Finance and economics, and this includes a public finance scrutiny unit. And then the team that myself and Mark are with, which is communities, infrastructure and environment. So my role essentially is environment, um, but I also cover planning under infrastructure and some of the local government functions that have been transferred to communities. So I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. Um, but I'll hand you over to Mark and he'll take you through some of the products that we provide. Okay, maybe just bit for clarity. Um, while Susie is not part of the brief, I'm agriculture and inland and sea fisheries. Um, and there are other things that we will discuss as and when, but for now that's the the delineation, so in all likelihood you'll see either Susie or myself. Uh, in terms of, of the products um, that we do produce, um, for those of you who've been here before, again, apologies, but we will we will provide um, in-depth analytical briefings. We can do that on a range of topics uh, as the committee commissions, or indeed if you as an individual MLA can request, um, that's available, and that service will be fairly widely available of, and that would be a, a written paper we produce. Uh, we do different types of product. You can get a briefing note, would be a two or three page, or all the way up to a, a 20, 30 page research or briefing paper, depending on the nature of the issue. Um, Susie mentioned the uh, legislative process. Ordinarily, uh, if a bill comes uh, before the committee, we would pre prepare and present a bill paper. Um, the current, I suppose, situation, even pertaining to the three bills that are, you are aware of, um, we are not going to produce a bill paper for those who are our normal um, standards, simply because we don't have the time and the resource. But we are intended to produce three papers for those uh, in support of, of this process. We also mentioned the statistical services. Very quickly, you might want to know uh, information pertaining uh, to your constituency or to another constituency in relation to an issue. We have uh, a dedicated team and individuals who can, who can furnish you with that information. And linked to that, and actually an area that has, has been growing really over the, the previous mandate and uh, has got quite sophisticated now. I don't know if any of you have used it or not. The mapping service that we have as well now is excellent in terms of being able to bring data to life. Uh, and we have a, a, a dedicated uh, officer upstairs who can, can really bring uh, a data series maybe over time and show how an issue has developed or where it can be concentrated. That, that is a, something I think going forward, particularly as you become maybe equipped with tablets as well, hopefully in the not too distant future, could be something that could be utilised. Um, whilst we're here from research, I also uh, really need to mention our, our colleagues in the library, um, and they would produce, for example, a product. And if you're in a plenary debate, um, the information packs are produced by them. Sometimes we will have a, a role in those or contribute part, but it's a predominantly a library uh, service. 
And additionally, and I think in the context of, of Brexit and other emerging issues, from time to time we will run workshops or seminars which will be able to, to you as members or even to your support staff. Um, and again, that's something that I'm sure going forward we may well actually be looking at. In terms of, just very quickly to say, how to, to access these services, you have a range of entry methods, both as a committee, as I said, you can commission, so through the clerk and through the chair. As individuals, you can contact us either directly through the library desk next door, come directly to our office or phone us. We're on assist. We're on the fourth floor. Or you can go through uh, Thomas McCook on the first floor, uh, where you can formally submit requests there. So... Um, we also, the other thing I didn't, uh, I regret it, or not regret it, regretfully missed, uh, and I mentioned was the blog. Uh, so from time to time, I have to say, as, as at this point in time, time doesn't permit, but we have over the, the course of the three years, for example, there's been a series of blog articles been put up on topical issues. Uh, we will hope to continue that going forward, but it's, it's fairly as and when, I suppose, we get the time to write those. Um, and the other thing, just for your reference, all the papers we've produ produced since the service existed, are accessible uh, on assist. So, you know, that's searchable by topic, or if you even uh, have a, want to come to us and ask us, was anything ever produced on? In all likelihood, many of these issues, you'll be aware, at some point over the last whatever years, we will have produced some type of material on. So I would encourage you to use it, uh, and please come and speak to us if we can be of assistance to you. Thank you. Okay. Agreed. Okay. Just one wee quick question. Time frames. Is there different time frames for produ production? Absolutely. And, a, and, a, and pressures as well as where we're at. Um, I think I'm not speaking out of term when I say that at the minute. We are now down a number of staff, not within the team that we work with here, but across RIAs. There are a number of portfolio areas where we, we don't have people. Um, there is a we will work, I suppose, with a, a request as it comes in, and we'll try and meet it. Um, but I, I'm just I'm telling you that it's supposed to fill up in the context of that's where we're at at this point in time. But we would always aim to try and uh, negotiate it and meet what the, the customer requires. A lot of our time frame will also correspond with the committee. So mm -hmm. whenever, say, if it's a, a bill paper, we'll try and produce that for committee stage at the start. Mm -hmm. And then anything that's supplementary from that, um, just with, with the, the movement of the committee as it goes through. Yeah. I'd just ask maybe would it be useful, um, given that we've just annulled two SRs on fisheries there, that probably go to debate now, would you produce a paper maybe for the committee on info on those? I would, if they're going to debate, I imagine there will probably be an information pack okay. prepared. Uh, yeah. uh, I suppose a number of the issues you'll not be surprised, I'm looking at a fisheries paper, will be contained in that. Uh, in terms of the schedule for that, I'm not clear. Um, because my priority is to try and do the agriculture one first. Okay. Uh, but yes, that's that's something I'm sure we... I'm not committing us to it. But <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have to be about the paper, I, just a... Yes, well, well uh, definitely I mean, in terms of... A non-departmental briefing, shall I say. Okay, okay well, uh, again... Three-page uh, briefing. We're happy to... I'm sure we can negotiate something and see what we can actually produce in the time frame of it. Um, as, given that there's no date for us, what was the, the debate at this point? It'll be probably two weeks. Two weeks, okay. Happy to, happy to look at you. it. Okay. okay um, Mark and Susie, thanks very much. Okay, um, thanks. I'm, say I'm, I'm familiar from being the former Dark Committee, um, along with William and others, that, of the work that you do. So we're very appreciative of it, and no doubt we'll be drawing on your your skills in the time ahead. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Um, we're going to move in now to closed session. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Correspondence. Correspondence um, index index is page one thirty six. Each item of correspondence suggests action. Are members okay with the action as a, and the correspondence is suggested. Page one thirty six. You all right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do, do members have any other items of business that they wish to raise? Yeah. Okay. I want to inform members that the next meeting is Thursday the 13th of February at 10 a.m. in room 29. I want to advise you this will be an all-day meeting. That might change after the discussion we're going to have. Okay. okay. Right. And um, I'll move to closed session now to uh, consider um, 
a session on committee planning and the forward uh, work program. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.